This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. To my wife, this book is affectionately dedicated. Preface Most of the adventures recorded in this book really occurred. One or two were experiences of my own, the rest those of boys who were schoolmates of mine. Huck Finn is drawn from life, Tom Sawyer also, but not from an individual. He is a combination of the characteristics of three boys whom I knew, and therefore belongs to the composite order of architecture. The odd superstitions touched upon were all prevalent among children and slaves in the West at the period of this story that is to say, thirty or forty years ago. Although my book is intended mainly for the entertainment of boys and girls, I hope it will not be shunned by men and women on that account, for part of my plan has been to try to pleasantly remind adults of what they once were themselves, and of how they felt and thought and talked, and what queer enterprises they sometimes engaged in. The Author Hartford 1876. Chapter 1. Tom! No answer. Tom! No answer. What's gone with that boy, I wonder? You, Tom! No answer. The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them about the room. Then she put them up and looked out under them. She seldom or never looked through them for so small a thing as a boy. They were her state pair, the pride of her heart, and were built for style, not service. She could have seen through a pair of stove lids just as well. She looked perplexed for a moment, and then said, not fiercely, but still loud enough for the furniture to hear, well, I lay, if I get hold of you, I'll—' She did not finish, for by this time she was bending down and punching under the bed with a broom, and so she needed breath to punctuate the punches with. She resurrected nothing but the cat. "'I never see the beat of that boy!' She went to the open door and stood in it, and looked out among the tomato-vines and jimson-weeds that constituted the garden. No, Tom— so she lifted up her voice at an angle calculated for distance, and shouted, "'You, Tom!' There was a slight noise behind her, and she turned just in time to seize a small boy by the slack of his roundabout, and arrest his flight. "'There! I might have thought of that closet. What you been doing in there?' "'Nothing.' "'Nothing? Look at your hands, and look at your mouth. What is that truck?' "'I don't know, Aunt.' Well, I know. It's jam. That's what it is. Forty times I've said, if you didn't let that jam alone, I'll skin you. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My! Look behind you, aunt! The old lady whirled round and snatched her skirts out of danger. The lad fled on the instant, scrambled up the high board fence, and disappeared over it. His aunt Polly stood surprised a moment, and then broke into a gentle laugh. "'Hang that boy! Can't I never learn anything? Ain't he played me tricks enough like that for me to be looking out for him by this time? But old fools is the biggest fools there is. Can't learn an old dog new tricks, as the saying is. But my goodness, he never plays them alike two days. And how is a body to know what's coming? He peers to know just how long he can torment me before I get my dander up, and he knows if he can make out to put me off for a minute or make me laugh, it's all down again, and I can't hit him a lick. I ain't doing my duty by that boy, and that's the Lord's truth, goodness knows. Spare the rod and smile the child, as the good book says. I'm a layin' up sin and sufferin' for us both, I know. He's full of the old scratch, but laws o' me. He's my own dead sister's boy, poor thing, and I ain't got the heart to lash him somehow. Every time I let him off, my conscience does hurt me so, and every time I hit him, my old heart most breaks. Well, well, a man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble, as the scripture says, and I reckon it's so. He'll play hooky this evening. That's southwestern for afternoon. And I'll just be obliged to make him work to-morrow to punish him. 
It's mighty hard to make him work Saturdays when all the boys is having holiday, but he hates work more than he hates anything else, and I've got to do some of my duty by him, or I'll be the ruination of the child." Tom did play hooky, and he had a very good time. He got back home barely in season to help Jim, the small colored boy, saw next day's wood and split the kindling before supper. At least he was there in time to tell his adventures to Jim, while Jim did three-fourths of the work. Tom's younger brother, or rather half-brother, Sid, was already through with his part of the work, picking up chips, for he was a quiet boy and had no adventurous troublesome ways. While Tom was eating his supper and stealing sugar as opportunity offered, Aunt Polly asked him questions that were full of guile and very deep, for she wanted to trap him into damaging revealments. Like many other simple-hearted souls, it was her pet vanity to believe she was endowed with a talent for dark and mysterious diplomacy, and she loved to contemplate her most transparent devices as marvels of low cunning. Said she, "'Tom, it was middling warm in school, wasn't it?' "'Yes'm.' "'Powerful warm, wasn't it?' "'Yes'm.' "'Didn't you want to go in a-swimming, Tom?' A bit of a scare shot through Tom, a touch of uncomfortable suspicion. He searched Aunt Polly's face, but it told him nothing. So he said, "'No, well, not very much.' The old lady reached out her hand and felt Tom's shirt, and said, "'But you ain't too warm now, though.' And it flattered her to reflect that she had discovered that the shirt was dry without anybody knowing that that was what she had in her mind. But in spite of her, Tom knew where the wind lay now, so he forestalled what might be the next move. "'Some of us pumped on our heads. Mine's damp yet, see?' Aunt Polly was vexed to think she had overlooked that bit of circumstantial evidence and missed a trick. Then she had a new inspiration. "'Tom, you didn't have to undo your shirt-collar where I sewed it to pump on your head, did you? Unbutton your jacket.' The trouble vanished out of Tom's face. He opened his jacket. His shirt-collar was securely sewed. "'Bother! Well, go along with you. I'd made sure you'd played hooky and been a swimmin', but I forgive you, Tom. I reckon you're a kind of singed cat, as the saying is, better'n you look, this time.' She was half sorry her sagacity had miscarried, and half glad that Tom had stumbled into obedient conduct for once. But Sidney said, "'Well, now if I didn't think you sewed his collar with white thread, but it's black.' "'Why, I did sew it with white. Tom!' But Tom did not wait for the rest. As he went out the door, he said, "'Siddy, I'll lick you for that.' 